So this is the last of the parables, I think, that Jesus tells before uh, his great Olivet prophecy in Matthew 24 and 25. Um, and we're going to consider some of the build up to that uh Olivet prophecy, particularly the build up to this parable, um, and see how Jesus is drawing on what he's already been teaching the Jews about the coming days. Um, you remember that he's already cursed the fig tree because it had no fruit, uh, and he's saying to the disciples in that about Israel, isn't he? Bringing forth no fruit. The fact that it's been digged and watered for three years, uh, left alone, ready to produce fruit, and but there's just no fruit on the, on the tree at all. Uh, and so now Jesus curses a real fig tree to show the disciples that's what's going to happen to this faithless nation who haven't produced fruit for God. Uh, and we're going to consider the parable of the vineyard as well. And then we're going to think about this parable, particularly the parable of the marriage of the king's son. Uh, and we'll see how it develops some of these themes and broadens some of those themes uh, in, a, in a wider way. So this evening we're going to think about the context, as we said. Uh, we're going to think about who's who, uh, particularly the king and his son and the servants, uh, and what it means to be bidden to the wedding. Why does it use that word? Uh, and then we'll think particularly about the servants and who they represent in this parable. And then see how Jesus draws on the Old Testament to teach the people he's speaking to. Uh, they are familiar with the Old Testament. Matthew is a gospel written uh, for people who are familiar with the Old Testament, isn't it? The number of Old Testament scriptures which are fulfilled uh, in Matthew, but not spoken of in other gospels. It's written to the Jews who are familiar with the Old Testament. And Jesus would be using this language here to get the people to think about what they know of what happened in the Old Testament. Uh, and then we're going to think about the call of the Gentiles as well, which is so clearly evident in uh, the end of this parable. Uh, and then think briefly about good and bad. Uh, I had a bit of a tricky situation trying to work out what was going on here with the bad uh, and the, uh, particularly the end of the parable. Um, so I'd like, appreciate your feedback on that. Uh, and then think about some exhortation for ourselves too. So, who is Jesus speaking to when he speaks this parable? Well, if you look at the end of chapter 21, it says, doesn't it, verse 45, when the chief priests and Pharisees had heard his parables, they perceived that he spake of them. And when they sought to let, but they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitude because they took him for a prophet. And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parable. So Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees here, isn't he? The chief priests as well. Uh, and you can see in verse 15 at the end of this parable, uh, again, the Pharisees are enraged by what they hear in this parable, aren't they? They then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. Um, so the Pharisees again interpret this parable as being about them and they need to react to what Jesus has said. Uh, and of course, they don't re react in the right way, do they? They don't react to faith. Rather, they try to kill him for what he said. And if we go through the parable that's just been told by the Lord Jesus Christ, we see these things coming out, don't we? He sent servants. This is the Lord of the vineyard, isn't it? Uh, who has this vineyard and goes off into a far country and leaves it to his servants and to husbandmen uh, to produce the fruit. Uh, and he sent servants, it says, uh, and they uh, don't give any fruit, do they, to the servants. Instead, they took one and beat one and killed another and stoned another. So he sends more servants and they do the same thing to them, don't they? And then he sends his son. They'll reverence my son, surely. Uh, but they don't. They, they say, come, this is the heir. Let us kill him and seize the inheritance for ourselves. And they throw him out the vineyard, don't they? And kill him. Uh, and Jesus asks the Pharisees, what will the Lord of the vineyard do to those husbandmen who treat, mistreated his son so awfully? And they answer the question, don't they? With their own mouths, they judge themselves and they say, he will miserably destroy those wicked husbandmen and uh, render, uh, so let the vineyard out to other husbandmen who will render him fruits in their season. So they recognise, don't they, what will happen to 
the uh, people who kill this son. And they, at the end of the fat parable, perceive that he spoke of them. They realise, don't they? Jesus is very pointedly teaching the Pharisees about what they will do to him, the son of the Lord of the vineyard. But Jesus repeats these themes very strongly, almost word for word, in some cases, in the parable we've just read, doesn't he? Because, again, the king sends forth his servants twice, uh, and the people he's sending them to take his servants and entreat, uh, entreat them spitefully and slew them. Those are all the same words in bold there um, on the screen. And the response of the king is the same as the Lord of the vineyard. He sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their cities. So the Pharisees would be well aware, wouldn't they, by now, that Jesus is speaking of them. When they hear these words coming out again in the next parable, they know he's speaking of them again. But the key difference, I think, in the two parables uh, is what happens next, isn't it? Because Jesus... Uh, goes beyond in his interpretation in the first parable, in the parable of the wicked husband men, to say, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. You are right in your assessment of what the Lord of the vineyard will do. And it's about you and it will be the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to another nation who produce the fruits in their season. Uh, and Jesus goes on to develop that theme in a lot more detail, doesn't he? in the parable of the marriage of the king's son. So from verse 8 to 10, we get a lot more detail given in parabolic language about the way this nation, uh, a nation who were not called originally, will be called in, in order to inherit the things which were given to the people who rejected it in the first place. You can see that sort of uh, shared ideas there, can't you? The, the words aren't exactly the same, but... Uh, those who were bidden were not worthy. The first people who were invited to call to the marriage were not worthy of it, were they? And so J Jesus says that the uh, king sends out his servants and says, go and find as, ma uh, as many as you find bid to the marriage. So the first parable is about what happens before and a little bit after the death of the son. The second parable is almost, I would suggest, entirely about what happens after the death of the son. Um, so we'll think about who these servants are, and that's going to be really important. Um, but I don't think they're necessarily talking about the same time period uh, in entirety. We've sort of got an overlap where the first parable is here, the death of the, uh, the lead up to the death of the Lord Jesus Christ and in his death and the removal of the, the Jewish nation. And the second parable talks about after the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, servants being sent again and the call of the Gentiles. So let's start with this phrase which Jesus opens his parable with, as he so often does, the kingdom of heaven. What does that mean? Um, our first instinct is to say, well, it's the kingdom of God, isn't it? You know, the thousand year rule of the Lord Jesus Christ on the earth. Uh, but it's not always describing that, is it? We couldn't be that prescriptive about that phrase in the Gospel of Matthew. It is just a phrase exclusive to the Gospel of Matthew, by the way. It's, it's kingdom of God in Luke. Um, but in Matthew, it's often the kingdom of heaven um, which I think is related to Daniel where you get uh, the ancient of days coming in the clouds of heaven and he's given a kingdom um, and Daniel is a, a theme that Matthew is inspired to draw on so many times uh, and this parable about kingdoms of heaven the kingdom of heaven uh, is a way of getting people back to Matthew so why is it not always describing the kingdom uh, actual on earth well jesus says doesn't he john the baptist says first in matthew chapter 3 and verse 2 jesus says when he starts his preaching and when he sends out his disciples later on in matthew chapter 10 he says go and say the kingdom of heaven is at hand now if it means the actual kingdom of god on earth then that we can't really interpret that phrase literally can we because at hand means no right now in, imminent is coming right now but the kingdom wasn't coming when Jesus started preaching it, was it? It wasn't coming when John the Baptist started preaching it. But the way into the kingdom was. The gospel being preached was the means by which you could become part of the kingdom. Uh, so the kingdom of heaven encompasses all of that, doesn't it? The preaching of the gospel in order to get you into the kingdom. 
Uh, and we see that in some of the parables Jesus tells, don't we? That's a, a theme that Jesus, again, picks up later on when he speaks in parables. We think about, come maybe come back to Matthew chapter 13. We're going to come back here later on. Um, as this is the parable of, uh, the chapter of the parables, isn't it? The kingdom of heaven parables. Uh, and in verse 24, we get the parable of the tares. Uh, he says, another parable he put forth unto them, saying, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. Uh, and the enemy comes and sows the, uh, the, the weeds among the, the, the wheat, don't they? Uh, but they don't immediately go and get rid of all the weeds. They let them grow. And when it's time for harvest, uh, they take the, uh, the weeds and burn them, don't they? Uh, and the wheat uh, grows up. Um, we're going to see that theme coming out here in Matthew 22 as well. Uh, I suggest that's about the judgment upon the first century Jews. Uh, it says, doesn't it? Um, uh, is that here? I don't think it is in this one, actually. Um, no, it is here. It is verse 40. Um, Jesus interprets this parable, doesn't he? Uh, and he says... Uh, the field is the world, verse 38, the good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. Um, and when we compare that phrase with other uses of that, occurring, that phrase in scripture, we find it is used to describe the end of the Jewish age. This isn't the end of the world as in the, big, the end of the kingdom of men and the start of the kingdom of God at the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 26, I think, says uh, that Jesus appeared once in the end of the world to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So Hebrews describes the end of the world or the end of the age as the time when Jesus died. The end of the age of Jewish worship at the temple, the sacrifice uh, period, uh, which was taken away when the Lord Jesus Christ died. Um, the end of the age is describing the Jewish age uh, as outlined, for example, in Daniel chapter nine, which we'll come back to later on, um, the 70 weeks prophecy, where at the end of that prophecy, uh, the sacrifice uh, and uh, the oblation are taken away, aren't they? Um, that was the end of the age. Um, we find it is used to describe treasure hidden in a field over, the, uh, over in a couple of parables later, uh, in verse 44, which a man finds and goes and sells all that he has and buys the field because of the joy that he's got. That's describing finding the gospel, isn't it, and hearing about it, uh, and then giving everything you have in order to get the, the hope of the kingdom uh, and be a part of it. Um, so that's an, a whole period, isn't it? It's not just the kingdom of God. It's the man's response to that uh, preaching of the gospel and then the kingdom as well. Uh, and the same with the merchant man who has pearls of uh, a good price that he finds. Um, so sometimes this phrase is used to describe the preaching of the gospel and judgment as a result of believing it or not believing it, receiving the reward or the judgment of God in your response to that. Um, it's not exclusively the kingdom of God, is it? Uh, and Jesus is going to use it in that way here when he speaks about the marriage of the king's son. It, we're going to see it's the preaching of the gospel uh, and also judgment for those who receive it or don't receive it uh, as God sees fit. So then come back, please, to Matthew 22. We read, uh, don't we, the start of the parable in verse two. The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son. So he Im instantly introduced the two characters, aren't we? The king and his son. So who is the king then? Um, if we could turn some of these verses up, that would be really helpful. The, the, the actual verse will be on the screen, but we're trying to look in the context of why it's used in these verses. So Psalm 47, please. I mean, this seems obvious in a way, doesn't it? It doesn't take much interpreting to realise that the king is God and his son is the Lord Jesus Christ. But why is he called the king? So Psalm 47 and verse 2. 
uh, says in verse 1, O oh, clap your hands, all ye people, shout unto God with the voice of triumph, for Yahweh Most High is terrible. He is a great king over all the earth. He sub shall subdue people under his feet and the nation and under us and the nations under his feet are our feet. Um, down in verse seven, for God is the king of all the earth, sing ye praises with understanding. Verse eight, God reigneth over the heathen. So when it describes God as the king, it's not just that he is the king of the Jews. He is the king over all the earth, isn't he? All nations are now under God's rule. Come over, please, to Psalm 145. These are words that we sing, aren't they? Um, so we're familiar with certainly the opening verses of Psalm 145. Um, but if we go down through the psalm, we see that this kingship of God is extended over all people. Verse 1, I will extol thee, my God, O King, and I will bless thy name forever and ever. Um, down in verse 9, it says, Yahweh is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his works. So it's speaking about all people, isn't it? All thy works shall praise thee, O Yahweh, and thy saints shall bless thee. They shall speak of the glory of thy kingdom and talk of thy power. Uh, verse 14, Yahweh upholdeth all that fall and raiseth up all those that be bowed down. Um, this is a description of God's kingship in the kingdom of God, of course, I think, but about his rulership over all people, isn't it? Uh, we see the same thing in Malachi chapter 1, verse 14. I am a great king, saith Yahweh of hosts, and my name is dreadful among the heathen. Uh, and this uh, is one your brain might have gone to uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 1. Let's just go there very briefly. So 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 17. He says, now unto the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, our saviour, be honour and glory forever and ever. Amen. Uh, and what Paul is speaking about here is the way that he's been called to be an apostle, isn't it? He's been uh, counted faithful uh, in being put into the ministry to, to, to preach the gospel, even though he was a persecutor and, uh, and, and injurious before. Uh, and he's the apostle to the Gentiles, isn't he? So all those who heard the gospel from Paul were mostly, gen well, mostly Gentiles, weren't they? He is a pattern to all of those who would follow after. Uh, so this is the preaching of the gospel to the Gentiles again. Uh, and God is called the king in that context. Um, so when God is described as the king, he is the king not just of the Jews, but of all the earth. Uh, and it's, that's the theme that we're going to see repeated throughout this parable. So who is the king's son then? Well, it is the Lord Jesus Christ, isn't it? He is the son of God. But Psalm 72 and verse one, let's just turn that on up as well. When it says he's the king's son, God of course is the king, but the way the scripture uses that phrase, the king's son, is used to describe not only the son of God, but the son of David. David is the king, isn't he? And the Lord Jesus Christ, as his descendant, is his son. So verse one, give the king thy judgments, O God, and thy righteousness unto the king's son. Uh, and this is a psalm, isn't it, about the kingdom of God, this beautiful psalm about the Lord Jesus Christ ruling between the river uh, and uh, fr sorry, from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. But then all the nations come, don't they? And offer their gifts to God, uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ in verse 9, 10 and 11. They all come, all kings bow down before him. All nations serve him. Uh, so this is the psalm of the son of God, but also the son of David, ruling over Jew and Gentile alike, when they do respond faithfully to his words. Finally, come over, please, to Revelation 19. Here is the marriage that's spoken of. Again, the kingdom of God is established. Uh, Revelation 19 is describing that time, isn't it? 
Um, and verse 6 says, I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude and the voice as, of, as the voice of many waters and the voice of many thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth, or is king. It's the same, basically the same way. It's the verb form of the word king. So God is the king. He is reigning as king. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honour to him for the marriage of the lamb is come and his wife hath made herself ready. So this is describing, isn't it, the time when the bride is joined to the son and she has this garment clean and white, uh, which is the righteousness of saints. Uh, and they are joined together at this supper. Uh, verse nine, blessed are they which are called to the marriage supper of the lamb. Uh, that is what is in prospect here in this parable. So then come back please to Matthew 22. Because the emphasis throughout this parable is on the king. It's God's response that is being emphasised here. The last time we get mention of the son is in verse two. That's the first and last time uh, that the son is mentioned. The focus is on God and how God acts as a response to the people uh, who do not accept the invitation. So verse two, it says the certain king, uh, and it's verse seven, isn't it? The king heard about their response and how they killed his servants uh, and then acts to burn the city. Uh, verse 11, the king came in to see the guests. And verse 13, the king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot and take him away. Uh, so the emphasis is on God and how he judges these situations. Uh, verse three then, it says, he sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding and they would not come. Now, uh, my King James Version doesn't do a very good job of uh, translating these words consistently. So if you have a different version, I don't know what you ha if it does in a different version, but mine says call uh, and bidden, uh, but it is just the word call twice. Um, and it's the same word in verse four when it says, tell them which were bidden. And in verse eight, when it says the ready, wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy, although they which were called were not, were not worthy. Uh, verse nine, go ye therefore into the highways and as many as ye shall find call them to the marriage. That word bid is the same as the word call all the way through here. Uh, and it's related to the word in verse 14, where it says many are called, but few are chosen. So how is this calling given then by the king, by God, uh, to these people? Well, it's not through the law of Moses, it's through the gospel, because in Romans chapter nine, we read these words, it was the gospel. So here's one of the reasons I think it's probably after the, um, after the, uh, it's not focusing on the Old Testament Jews, it's focusing on the New Testament Jews uh, and their response to Christ and the gospel that his uh, apostles preached. So verse 11 of Romans nine, speaking about who really is Israel. Is it just those who are natural Jews or is it those who respond to the gospel in faith? He says in verse 11 about the children of Rebekah, that is Jacob and Esau, the children not being yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand. That's the word chosen later on in, uh, in the parable. Not of works, but of him that calleth. So it's not about works, the works of the law, which the Jews in Romans are so keen to keep, aren't they? It's about God calling, uh, the gospel, which is given to call the people uh, to God. Uh, and 2 Thessalonians 2 shows us exactly that. It is the gospel. So 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 14 says uh, about God, it says in verse 13, God from the beginning has chosen you to salvation. That's that word again. We've seen it at the end of the parable. Many are called, but few are chosen. God has chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth, whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the gospel is what called these people in the parable. 
Uh, it's not merely God's promises to the fathers of Israel in the Old Testament, which is, of course, the gospel preached to Abraham. It's the gospel in the New Testament preached to the Jews in the first century. But Paul preached. Paul is preaching it. He says, isn't he? I called you. Uh, God called you by our gospel, the gospel he preached uh, as that one who's been made an apostle. And of course, the Jews were called to that, weren't they, in the days of the Lord Jesus Christ? Remember that language of uh, the bride and the bridegroom is used by John the Baptist, isn't he? When uh, he's speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ, who hasn't yet appeared to Israel, but will do shortly. He says, he that has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. Um, so Jesus is that bridegroom, isn't he? The one who's going to be at the marriage, uh, the son who is going to uh, take part in this wedding. Uh, and Jesus himself says, doesn't he? The whole purpose of his gospel, his preaching, uh, was not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Uh, and you can see in the start of his ministry there, the Jews are already rejecting the call, aren't they? We are righteous. We don't need to repent. You know, we haven't sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's for the, the publicans and sinners. They need your preaching. We don't need your preaching because we're already righteous. But Jesus said, I didn't come to call the righteous. If you think you're righteous, then I'm not calling you. I came to call sinners to repentance. They are already rejecting that, aren't they? Uh, in the early days of the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and that really telling phrase is given at the end of the verse in the parable in verse three, isn't it? And they would not call them who were bidden. They've been asked to come, but they do not want to. Uh, and in chapter 23 and verse 37, the interpretation is given to us by the Lord later on, isn't it? When he looks at Jerusalem and he weeps over it because of the way they did not respond to the gospel which he preached to them. He says, uh, verse 37 of Matthew 23, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. You didn't want it when I was there, there to comfort and protect you with uh, the wings of this hen, to, to, to cover you over and, and deliver you. You didn't want it. It's Jerusalem, isn't it? And the Jews who live there, who uh, these people uh, are in parable. Those who are called but reject it are the, the Jews of Jerusalem in the first century. So verse four, again, he sent forth other servants saying, tell them which were bidden, behold, I prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fatlings are killed. There's that marriage supper language that we saw in Revelation. And all things are ready, come unto the marriage. So again, the call goes out again, doesn't it? It's not that they rejected Jesus and therefore that was it. There was no more calling. They were called again uh, by uh, this second calling. So who are these second call? Who are the people who give this second calling then? Who are the servants here who are sent out? Well, the servants are the prophets, aren't they? You know these words well from Amos. Surely the Lord Yahweh will do nothing but that he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets, his servants. They are God's servants, aren't they? To go and speak God's word. The servants, the prophets. Uh, and they are sent by God. Again, that language is used. Like it says here, doesn't it? He sent forth other servants. He sent prophets to them to bring them again to Yahweh, but they would not give ear. Again, that's a really close match, isn't it, to what we've got here in the parable. Sent forth servants to call them, and they would not. Again, Jeremiah 24 says something similar. The, uh, Yahweh sent a prophet to the children of Israel, which said, Thus saith the Lord Yahweh of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you out of the house of bondage. You need to repent. And because you haven't repented, you'll go to Babylon for 70 years. I think, though, these aren't the prophets of the Old Testament. Um, at this point, the marriage is being prepared, isn't it? The king's son, it seems is ready for the marriage. Um, and he just needs the guests to come. 
So it seems as if Jesus has been in uh, has been slain and then raised to life again. That's what the first parable dealt with in chapter twenty one. I think this is the next stage, and that these are New Testament prophets sent firstly to the Jews in these opening verses here, um, and then to the Gentiles uh, in verses 8 to 10. And if you come over to Acts 13, we see this language is used, don't we? Uh, and it's no surprise that the primary prophet who is used to do this teaching is Paul uh, and Barnabas, but mainly Paul. So Acts 13, verse 1, there were in the ecclesia that was at Antioch, so Gentile territory now, certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon, that was called Niger, uh, Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Menaean, which had been brought up with Herod, Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. So these are prophets, aren't they? New Testament prophets. Uh, and sometimes we don't give enough consideration to the work of the prophets in the first century ecclesia who are there speaking God's word as it's revealed to them at that time. Uh, it says they ministered to the Lord and fasted. That word ministered is like the word servant. So they are the servants, aren't they? They are ministering to the Lord uh, and fasted. And the Holy Spirit said, separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. And the work that they have to go on to do is to go to the, speak to the synagogues. In Later on in Acts 13, you can read that uh, from verse 14 onwards. They go to the synagogue in Antioch in Pisidia and speak. And most of the Jews reject it, don't they? Um, verse um, 45, most of them are filled with envy uh, and they contradict and blaspheme the things which are spoken of by Paul. Uh, and Paul has to say to them, beware, beware, because the work is coming, a work which you will not believe unless a man declares it to you. Um, so the first century prophets, like Paul, uh, were the ones who went out and spoke the word, firstly to the Jews. Uh, and you can see that through Paul's first missionary journey all the way through. He always goes into the synagogue, doesn't he? As his manner was, is the phrase. That's his, the way he preaches. He goes to the synagogue first, speaks to the Jews, and when they reject it, he goes to the Gentiles. So these Jews are still being called, even after the death of the re and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. They are still being called by the gospel preached by Paul. And when they reject it, and they would not, Paul turns to the Gentiles. So then, come back please to Matthew 22. Um, because these first century Jews are acting like their forefathers who, who lived hundreds of years before. Um, we've seen that quote from Jeremiah already, haven't we? Where Jeremiah is saying, God has sent prophets to you and you would not hearken to them. Uh, and particularly this language here that we've read in verse three uh, about the servants and then verse six and seven about how they treat the servants and then the king's judgment upon them is very heavily, heavily based upon the Old Testament. So we've read verse three and four, haven't we? Um, verse six says, the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth. And he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. So um, let's turn up please. Second Chronicles chapter 36. Remember these are Pharisees and chief priests who would be so familiar with these, prophet, these, uh, these words, wouldn't they? They would know instantly when it, Jesus uses these words, he is speaking about the end of the kingdom of Judah. Second Chronicles 36, verse 15. And Yahweh, God of their fathers, sent to them, that's the phrase, isn't it? By his messengers, rising up betimes, Continually and carefully, it says, you know, often, con constantly sending messengers to Jerusalem. And because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place, but they mocked the messengers of God and despised his words and misused his prophets. Isn't that the same as they took his servants and entreated them spitefully? until the wrath of Yahweh arose against his people and there was no remedy. When the king heard thereof, he was wroth. Uh, verse 19, the Babylonians come, don't they? 
Um, they've been in and around Judah for years. Judah's been this puppet state uh, of Babylon. Uh, and now the Babylonians bring that final destruction on Jerusalem. And verse 19 says, they burned the house of God and break down the walls of Jerusalem and burned all the palaces thereof with fire and destroyed all the goodly vessels thereof. He sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. The warning is so clear, isn't it? That the Lord Jesus Christ is giving here. Remember what happened to Judah, destroyed by the Babylonians and Jerusalem burned. That is what awaits those who reject the call. And you are the ones receiving the call, he says to the Pharisees. Come over please to Zephaniah chapter one. Zephaniah is also prophesying uh, in the days of Josiah and his sons, as you can see from the opening verses of, of the prophecy. Um, so in the days of Josiah, Zephaniah prophesies like this in verse seven. This is Judah and Jerusalem who are full of idolatry, worshipping Baal uh, and Malcolm, you know, the one where you make your children pass through the fire. Molech, that's Malcolm. Um, so verse seven says, hold thy peace at the presence of the Lord Yahweh for the day of Yahweh is at hand for the Yahweh hath prepared a sacrifice. He hath bid his guests. That's the king saying, isn't it? Behold, I've prepared my dinner. Call those who are bidden to the marriage and they would not. Uh, and verse 18, again, uses this language of wrath and fire, doesn't it? So speaking about the destruction that's coming on Jerusalem, this great day of Yahweh, as it says in verse 14, um, it says, neither their, verse 18, neither the silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of Yahweh's wrath. The king was wrath. But the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy, for he shall make even a speedy riddance of all them that dwell in the land. So it's not just Jerusalem destroyed and burned, is it? It's carried away captive by these Gentiles. Again, what the Lord Jesus Christ will go on to speak about in the Olivet Prophecy. Um, Jerusalem trodden down of the Gentiles, then led in captivity into all nations until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Uh, one last one. Come over, please, to Daniel chapter nine, which we uh, we looked at, uh, we referred to briefly earlier. This is uh, the seventy weeks prophecy describing the end of the Jewish age, the end of the world, as Jesus called it in Matthew thirteen in his parables. There, um, so Matthew, uh, Daniel chapter nine, uh, we have, don't we, the death of the Lord Jesus Christ in verse 26. After three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince shall come and, uh, sorry, the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, Jerusalem and its temple. And the end thereof shall be with a flood and unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. So we've got the end there, haven't we? That phrase that Jesus uses, the end of the age. Uh, and here we've got the people of the prince. Well, that was the Roman army, wasn't it? That came to destroy Jerusalem after the days of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yet here they're called the people of the prince. The prince being Messiah, the prince himself. They're the armies that the Lord Jesus Christ himself sent to Jerusalem to destroy them. He being the one who is controlling all world events, all things being given into his hand, all principalities and powers, angels and dominions being subject to him. He sends the, peop the, print the people to destroy the city. Um, just as it says here, he sent forth his armies, God. These are God's instruments, aren't they? To bring judgment upon his people and burned up their city. Uh, and that's exactly what happened, isn't it? After a generation or so after the Lord Jesus Christ's resurrection. Remember, he said, didn't he? This generation shall not pass. And that's a phrase that's always used about the Pharisees. This generation, a generation later, 40 years later, Jerusalem is burned by the Romans under General Titus. 
uh, who is later to become the emperor, Titus. And Jesus calls them his armies, doesn't he? They are the people of the prince who do this. Uh, and that shouldn't be a, a surprise or something to sort of shy away from, because that's always been the way that these things have been described. Um, when God brings Gentile armies to bring destruction upon his people, they are his armies. So in Joel, we read Yahweh shall utter his voice before his army about the Babylonians who are coming. Uh, and we've read, haven't we, the people of the prince shall come and destroy the city and the sanctuary. That's about the Romans. Uh, so this phrase here, his armies, was perfectly fulfilled in what the Roman army did to Jerusalem when they burned the temple uh, and pretty much raised Jerusalem to the ground. Josephus says you would never have guessed that someone lived there. So complete was the destruction of the city. So the Jews were called, but they would not. So then, Daniel, uh, sorry, Matthew 22, verse 8, he said to his servants, the wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find bid to the marriage. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with guests. Now, it's worth noting, which I found a little bit tricky to get my head around, that this parable isn't in strict time order. Because the call to the Gentiles, delivered by the apostles, the servants, the prophets in the New Testament, comes in time order before AD 70, doesn't it? The apostles are preaching AD 44-ish. Now that's Paul's first missionary journey, it seems. Uh, and the destruction of Jerusalem, which is described here in verse 7 in the parable, is, again, some 30 years later. Um, so the parable isn't in strict time order. Um, but that does match the pattern we see elsewhere. Um, so this is the same order as the Olivet Prophecy, which verse 27 to 30 of Matthew 24, uh, describing uh, the lightning coming out of the west and the eagle, the Roman eagle coming, uh, and then the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, which I believe is the Roman armies coming to uh, destroy Jerusalem. That comes before the calling of the Gentiles, where it says he shall send his angels with the sound of a great trumpet to gather together his elect from the four winds of heaven. And it, I appreciate that's not everyone's interpretation of the Olivet Prophecy, um, so I'm happy to talk about that afterwards. Um, that's not crucial uh, to the argument here. Um, it's also exactly the same as we get in Acts 13, which we've already referred to, haven't we? So Acts 13 was where Paul is said to be a prophet. Just come over, Peter, Acts 13 again. Because in Acts 13, verse 41, we read uh, Paul saying to the Jews, Behold, ye despisers, and wonder and perish, for I work a work in your days, a work which ye shall in no wise believe, though a man declare it unto you. And what he's doing is quoting from Habakkuk about the way the Gentiles, the Babylonians, this you know, awful people in Habakkuk's eyes, were going to come and destroy Jerusalem. And Habakkuk saying, how can you let this happen? How can a righteous people be judged by such a wicked nation? And God says, well, it's coming. Believe what I'm saying or perish. So he speaks about the potential judgment upon the Jews by the Gentile nations here in verse 41. And then he says that they're going to go to the Gentiles. Um, so particularly when he says uh, in verse 46, it was necessary that the word of God should be first spoken to you, but seeing you put it from yourselves and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles, to the Jew first, then to the Greek. Uh, but that word unworthy is what we get here in the parable. They which were bidden were not worthy, says the king. And now Paul makes the same assessment of them. You are not worthy because you have not accepted the teaching of the gospel. The judgment about AD 70 comes first. Then the preaching goes to the Gentiles because of the Jews' unworthiness. It's exactly the same pattern as the parable, isn't it? So my question was then, who are the bad in the wedding? 
Um, and I'm still not quite there with it, so I would appreciate some help. Um, verse 11 says, the king came in to see the guests. And that's my tr tricky, uh, tricky section. Uh, the wedding describes the gospel being preached and then the kingdom of God as well. But when the king comes in, that sounds like, uh, you know, the kingdom of God is established, doesn't it, on the earth. So how are they bad there in that situation? Because it says, doesn't it, um, verse 10, he gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good. And the wedding was filled or furnished with guests. And when the king came in to see the guests, there are bad guests there, aren't they? Um, well, I think the bad, you probably got this here way ahead of me anyway, but the bad are those who are in verse 11 to 14, those who have no wedding garment. Um, so we're going to see these phrases here, um, gathered together the bad uh, as well as the good and the wedding is filled or furnished with guests but the bad is cast into outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth uh, again that's exactly what we've read about already in the parable of the lord jesus christ the parable of the dragnet so we get this net that gathers in every kind of fish uh, and when it talks about the separation process he says he suffers the wicked or the bad same word from the just uh, and when the net is full is brought into land um, and the wicked who are like these bad fish are cast into the furnace of fire where there is wailing and gnashing of teeth um, so it seems uh, that again as I said that's a parable describing the end of the age we say social at the end of the age which is the Jewish age um, so I'm a bit torn about what the, uh, the bad here is speaking about. Uh, it, it could be seen as being the judgment seat outright, couldn't it? Um, but then um, my tricky bit is how are they in the wedding already? Um, so if you do have any uh, comments on that, I would really appreciate it. Um, let's finally then think about some exhortation for ourselves. Um, I've, I've suggested there, that's, it's a suggestion um, that the judgment process, which was enacted in AD 70, when uh, the Jews were rooted out and Jerusalem was burned and the influence of Judaism on Christianity was significantly lessened. Uh, you know, those who were following Paul around uh, persecuting him were no longer doing so. There was no temple to, to try and uphold, was there? There was no law of Moses to be kept because the temple had been burned. Um, so those fish were moved and gathered out of the way and there's only the good left. Uh, that will be repeated at the judgment seat. It's not the same thing, but the similar process takes place. So then, who are, uh, what is our exhortation from this then? Well, the lesson Jesus says at the end is many are called, but few are chosen. Um, and it's telling, isn't it, that all the wedding guests have responded to the call. They've heard it and responded to it. They're all gathered in. Um, and this word for garment is the word for uh, put on here. As many as have been baptised into Christ have put on Christ. So it seems, I'd suggest at some point, that all the people who are in this wedding had been baptised, or had responded to the gospel at least. They put on Christ. They had a wedding garment at some stage. Uh, and yet... When this one person comes to the wedding, he hasn't got it, has he? He hasn't brought it at all. Uh, and again, it's like Zephaniah, where those who are clothed with strange apparel are punished. Those who are associated with idolatry. Uh, that's what the strange apparel is used to describe there. Those who are clothing themselves in black <coughs> garments to worship a false god, rather than the white garments of the high priests and, and the Levites. Um, they're a false priesthood who are pretending to serve God and at the same time serving their own lusts and pleasures in worshipping idols, which, which is a really telling thing for Jesus to say, isn't it, here in that context. Those who are judged by the king here are those who hide away what they really want to worship and pretend to go along with true worship all along. The king knows, of course, doesn't he? Everyone else might be fooled. Uh, but the king knows. And of course, putting on the Lord Jesus Christ isn't a one-off thing, is it? It's not just something you did at your baptism and therefore 
you have the Lord Jesus Christ as the garment that you wear throughout your life. Because in Romans it says, let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on, same words, the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the lust, uh, for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. <coughs> so it's a constant thing, isn't it? It's every day we take up our cross and follow him. Every day the deeds of the flesh have to be mortified uh, and we don't make provision for them. We put on the Lord Jesus Christ every day uh, and maybe that's a really helpful thing to think about, isn't it? Before we get dressed in the morning, before you actually put on your garment for the day, there should be a garment you put on before that uh, in order to make sure you're not walking in that way of life, but instead walking honestly, not trying to hide your secret false worship uh, and pretend to worship the true God. Um, make sure that garment is there and I'll speak to myself as much as you of course uh, let's finally look at second Peter chapter 1 to finish this is our our last reference because Jesus said didn't he many are called but few are chosen just because you've been called by the gospel just because you've heard it and responded to it does not mean that you are chosen you have to take steps to yourself in order to receive that election that calling uh, and that being chosen in the grace of God, of course. Um, so verse five says, isn't it? Beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue and virtue knowledge and knowledge temperance and to knowledge uh, temperance patience and patience godliness and to godliness brotherly kindness and to brotherly kindness love. So those are the characteristics we seek to develop, aren't they? Putting off the flesh and making no provision for it and putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. If these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. So here is the exhortation given by the Lord Jesus Christ and Peter. Wherefore, the rather brethren, give diligence. So you do that by doing what it said in verse five to, 10, uh, five to seven, giving all diligence add to your faith virtue. Here's how you give diligence. You add these characteristics to your way of life. Giving diligence to make your calling and election sure. Your calling and your choosing. Make sure it's not just a calling. Make sure it is a choosing as well by adding those things to your way of life. For if you do these things, ye shall never fall. Thank you.